Hi everyone, welcome back to The Watch Insider. My name is Brian and thank you all for logging on. I am joined tonight by Tim Masso. I'm here. And we've got a exciting show tonight filled with lots of interesting watches. Some you may know, some you may not. And as always on the Wednesday night show, please feel free to ask any questions to the chat. That's why this is a live show and that's why me and Tim are here. So Tim, why don't we do a quick wrist check yeah, definitely. and we'll get this show started. You guys, you know the EZM, so I'm not gonna waste any time on this. 500 pieces, 2017, 43 millimeter tegmented steel. It's a reverse chrono, 60 minute register on center with the seconds. Okay, let's talk about your watch because it is new to the show. Yes, yeah, so this is a watch I have not worn on the show before. It's something that I've been tooling around with for a little bit now. I have it on a uh, different strap that comes with it originally, but something that I think really sets the watch apart, gives it a very interesting look. Um, and uh, I'm very much enjoying it. So here we have a 5140 in platinum. That is, for those that don't know the reference numbers, an ultra thin paddock perpetual. This version having a bright blue dial. Originally the watch comes on a navy blue crocodile strap. I've since switched it with almost like a caramel color or mess strap that gives it a much more casual look uh, that I think is more suited for summertime and daily wear. I really thought that this combination of the strap tone contrasting stitch and the white metal with the blue dial made this almost a baby Calatrava Pilot 5524G. And that's funny because we have a very atypical 5524G on the table tonight, but a lovely balanced case dial and lug space and giving it traditional proportions. This is a truly elegant Patek Philippe watch powered by a more recent version of the premium Caliber 240Q, the micro rotor automatic, beautifully executed. You can see Gyromax free sprung balance, a wonderful set of Cote de Genève about as richly engraved with abrasive wheel as you will ever see. You can see how their, their tone shifts from one side to the other. That's how you can tell stamped Cote de Genève from the true abrasive wheel kind. They have a bit of a gradient from side to side. And of course, there's the engine turning, the mirrored anglage, and a lovely Cote de Genève across the 22 karat gold rotor. Nice and slender, that's the way it is. And of course, we are talking about a rare and special timepiece. Boom. And that's yeah, a nice so, one. So, uh, Zach Blast Brenny from Hermes is like butter, and like I honestly, I think that is exactly the way that I would describe it. Like the strap is super soft and supple, it's comfortable to wear. Um, I'm actually surprised, like I am loving wearing the watch. Like I've, I've been wearing it just about every day. And even though it's summertime, and I, you know, and it's not called an Aquanaut or, or a Nautilus or any other type of sport watch, I feel like it's casual enough to wear every day. And you know, the strap is ultra comfortable even in the heat. I would also say this, with the color of that watch and the white metal, it, it feels like a summer watch. It has yeah. a summer spirit to it. It's Ex not your pool watch, but it's definitely your by the pool watch. Exactly. Okay, uh, welcome everybody back, all of our regulars. Thank you all for logging in. Um, Tim, why don't we get us started? We've got some really interesting watches okay. here on the table. Where do you want to take us first? The strangest watch on the table, and that's even considering the IWC Da Vinci. A full, precious metal, Breitling Super Ocean, 1990s. This was Breitling under the Schneider family in its pomp. The 90s were great for Breitling across every model line. Chronomat, Colt, Super Ocean, Montbriant, and Navitimer. Breitling really was the it luxury watch brand of that era, and this was one of the richest offerings. A bit ridiculous, a dive watch on a full gold bracelet, and of course the Super Ocean, not quite the Submariner, a timepiece that someone would really have to love inside and out to purchase at retail back then when the price of this watch could have come darn close to buying you a Ducati 996. And what's so interesting about this watch, and I you know, I brought this on the show after seeing it into the vault, and I'm gonna, we're gonna compare it to one other watch here on the show, but it came out in an era when somebody would walk into the store, you know, you, you really didn't have as much research going on online where people were going and looking in advance to see what they would purchase, and somebody was buying this watch instead of a Rolex or instead of a Patek or instead of a old gold watch like that, simply because it was a bigger, sportier, more rough and tumble type of piece. And I'll also say this, watch shopping online was almost unheard of during the 90s. So someone truly did walk in unprompted, fall in love with this piece and walk out of it because that's how watch retail was done in the 90s. Back then, it would have been considered huge. Today, you can see on my wrist, it's actually a reasonable size. The combination of the yellow gold and the blue sunburst dial in that metallic tone is 
it's extravagant, but it's also explosive. As you can see what it's doing in the soft light of our studio, and you can see that it also has a handsome full Arabic numeral dial, which gives it a lovely technical instrument-like quality. So, I mean, I just think the watch is freaking awesome. Like, it's first off, it's not a watch that you're probably ever gonna see on somebody else's wrist ever again. Number two, there's no way that they made a lot of these. Number three, if you're looking for an all gold watch that's got a retro vintage vibe that that pops in addition to it being all yellow gold, I just think it's something that sets itself apart from, you know, let's face it, all the other presidents out there that you can just purchase. I'll also say this, it's a timepiece that wears surprisingly well and how much do you dig that first generation professional bracelet in yellow gold? Yellow golds in a watch this chunky, boisterous, and sports oriented. But it doesn't feel that large. It doesn't feel that large. Like just because again, overall, like what is it? A 40, it doesn't 40 look and that large. To, to, to 40. It feels large on the wrist. It's not a big watch, but it's a watch with a big presence, and it is a lot of gold. With the way the Breitling case is built, it is simply massive. I mean, yellow does not do me any favors. You know what? I, I think it works surprisingly well, honestly. You kind of do need to have the skin tone for it, but the With blue this is color universal. strap, it could also be really cool. Yeah, the, the blue is universal. Yeah. You could tone this down on a leather strap, and it would look very cool. Okay. Should we compare it to the, yeah, definitely. the other piece? Because So, brought a second watch here, all yellow gold, blue dial as well. A little bit different, different brand here, but we can you know do sort of a this or that. Of course, guys, the Yachtmaster was a product of the 1990s. Originally, the Submariner was going to be redesigned, and most of the design concepts that went into the Yachtmaster were originally conceived for a luxury next-generation Submariner. Rolex realized it had to embrace its reputation as a totem of status and a luxury brand in the modern era, but it didn't want to do that, so to speak, to the sub. It didn't want an overly refined effete sub. So instead, all of those ideas, the full precious metal bezel, the maxi style dial with the larger indices, the more slender and refined case profile that's arguably more similar to a Daytona than it is to a sub, all of that went into the Yacht Master, with the result that the sub carried on as the no-nonsense tool watch and a new above the waves aquatic sports watch was born. Now, of course, it is very different from the sub. You do have that full gold bezel and it's also bi-directional in that you could turn it in either direction in the interest of timing the countdown to a match within a regatta. The timepiece is also a bit more graceful. I mentioned that it has a, a very Daytona-like case and it's 100 meters water resistant like the Daytona even though it does have a trip lock crown. It's a graceful thing on the wrist because of the slender profile and you can see it easily fits underneath the cuff. And I will say that between this and the Breitling, this is the one that pairs more naturally with the dress cuff simply because its aspect ratio and its proportions are more elegant in every respect. It is an immortal. I would say it's now pretty close to being part of the Rolex Canon. It's not quite on Daytona and GMT, Datejust and Submariner level, but it's definitely getting up there and I think it's going to be part of the collection forever. It's head and shoulders above the Milgoss. I don't think this will ever be discontinued and then recontinued later. No, I, I tend to agree with you. And I think that this is very much an overlooked watch. I think that this is the sort of watch that most Rolex clients or most call it customers at large don't even know that they made an all yellow gold yacht master with a bright blue dial. Because when you're looking at 40 millimeter sports watches, the offerings now are honestly somewhat limited. You know, you don't have the, the gold GMTs anymore. You've got call it day date 40s that you can look at. You can look at all gold subs. Um, and then if you want to go back into the past, you've got this piece here, which I think you can still pick up at a really good price relative to some of the other 40 millimeter pieces uh, that they're still making. I'll also mention that long before the sub dispensed with its strap tool holes in the lugs, the Yachtmaster was launched with solid lugs. It was never a strap tool type of watch, the idea being you would always wear it on the factory bracelet. And early on, we got the solid end links on the Yachtmaster, so many refinements went into this watch that would later find their way into the sub. In fact, the oversized indices on the Yachtmaster that launched in 1992 would eventually find their way to the sub first in the 2003 Kermit, the anniversary Submariner, and later on on the six digit on a full-time basis. Awesome, uh, quick shout out to our man CQ who's holding it down at the office right now and he is on the chat ready to answer any questions that we don't get a chance to see. 
I can see Dustin Van Patten has just joined in. We've got Hans N. And he's asking, is P. Diddy on tonight, or is this P. Diddy night? It does seem like we have a lot of We do have a lot of appropriate because there's another one watches. Too. Yeah, I think we're we're not even done yeah, with we're the not Puff even done Daddy with Allotment. Global. We've also got some 80s uh, corporate raider watches on the on the table tonight. So we've got our 90s cliches and 80s in equal measure. So let's 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 bring out a watch let's that if you were it. that if you were gonna raid a pension fund in the 90s. 1980s, you would probably be wearing this watch. So here we have a Da Vinci perpetual calendar uh, in 18 karat white gold, black crocodile strap, stark white dial. You know, what A, what stands out about this watch first and foremost, I think is just called the complete retro vibes of the overall case and the construction of how the st straps attach to the case. You've got a solid case back. Tim will talk a little bit more about the movement, but what's really striking about this watch, and I think it's something that became a hallmark for IWC moving forward, even into more recent watches, is having the four register uh, year window there, that it showed the full the full year of the perpetual. Because you know one of the things that we would always look at is if it went forward too far, there was no way to move it back. That is absolutely true. So to see that that one is set to 2018, that's fine. You can reset that in 30 seconds to the present day. This is a watch that features the Kurt Claus Coordinated Perpetual Calendar System, which is to say, if you want to set the calendar, it's as easy as setting a date just, a Rolex date just, because everything, including the moon phase, you'll note, is mechanically programmed to move in sync. The day, the date, the month, the moon, and eventually the year and the decade. All you have to do is operate the quick set. You can never make up an imaginary combination of registers. And this takes all the thinking out of the equation. You don't have to look up a moon phase online. It's a brilliant system, mechanically programmed up to the year 2100. And of course, the timepiece, about as IWC as they get with a design by Hanno Bircher that launched back at the Basel Fair in 1985 with a hinge lug design. This was going to be the flagship of IWC. The 3750, a timepiece that is lovely with a plexiglass crystal because they needed to achieve height. Oh, look at that. Isn't that incredible? They needed to achieve the height over all the hands on this complicated dial. And the timepiece features an aventurine moon phase. The Coordinated perpetual calendar system is built on top of a Valshu 7750 with the regulator, the train, and the power source replaced by IWC and all the regulation done in-house. This is effectively an in-house caliber and the timepiece has a wonderful wrist presence. Because of the hinge lugs and they're double hinged, not single hinged, it will wear on any wrist. This was the mega watch of 1985. Automatic winding, a chronograph, a moon phase, a perpetual calendar, and in this white gold iteration, hefty, substantial, premium. This was a rare watch from a brand almost no one stateside was talking about back in 1985, and even in Europe, it was a best-kept secret for fans and devotees of the watchmakers from Schaffhausen. So I'm not saying that obviously all things, you know, all things are equal as far as call it the movement construction or even the level of finishing, but it's crazy when you think about what a Lung & Son or a Paddock or some of these other brands do charge for a perpetual calendar chrono moon phase relative to what this watch costs. I mean, it, it's it's actually nuts. I've seen this watch in steel for under ten grand, which is ridiculous, frankly. Uh, but I'll also say that it's the ultimate buy. I'm glad deals like that exist because there are too many sixty thousand dollar fifty seven elevens out there. There have to be a few watches like they're this. Up to, they're up to eighty now. Okay. Well, there you go. In the time we've been on the air, they've gone up to 80. <laughs> There's, there are watches like this for the hardcore folks who are a little bit different. Kurt Kloss, Hanno Bircher, 1980s spirit, redolent of its era. Again, you've got your R107 Mercedes SL560. You've got your Gordon Gecko on the VCR. Just watched Wall Street recently. Yeah, yeah exactly. You, you, what You're watching... What, what is it? Al Bundy was the number one show. Guns N' Roses was breaking out in the late 1980s. 1988, I think that was the year Appetite for Destruction charted. Um, let's see. I'm more of a In Rock We Trust type guy. I was born in 1984. So let's let's make that the official Y&T watch of the night. Okay. Um, so let's we'll move forward a little bit in time. Let's talk about the Vacheron that you were so excited to tell me about. 
Here we have a Vacheron Historique 1936. So we've brought Historique watches on the show before. This is the Historique 1936, launched in the year 2000. It was a 600 piece limited edition. And what's so interesting about this watch is that the watch itself actually features a JLC Reverso movement. So Tim will show you that in a second, but overall the watch has a lot of character, very interesting vibe. I would say that if you had to you know, describe what the dials and indices of a Vacheron in the early 2000s looked like, this pretty much surmises all of them. It does have one of the last Sigma dials, which you can see there at the bottom if they can zoom in. And Tim can go a little bit more into what the Sigma dial represents as you know, well as why this is a special piece. Yeah, these are technically called the a prior marks. That's an acronym for the Swiss Precious Metals Trade Association that originally promoted gold labeling on the dials of Swiss watches back during the 1970s. Almost everyone jumped on board, but very few continued to use that labeling standard with the little Sigma style signature down on the dial past the 1980s. By the late 90s, it was almost unheard of, and Vacheron and Patek were amongst the very last to do so, dropping the Sigma signature on their watches in the early 2000s. This is literally a millennial watch because it came out in Y2K. It is Y2K compliant, and it is gloriously redolent to the 1930s, as this design specifically, the Carré 1936 from the Historique collection, was designed to reference a 1936 Vacheron square watch that predated reference numbers. So I can't give you the reference of that model. All I can say is that this is an incredibly faithful representation of it. It's equipped with a full red gold deployant clasp, which I love because oftentimes on vintage watches, there's corner cutting and pin buckles, which are historically correct, but don't feel sufficiently rich. This feels perfect. And you can see it's about 31.6 millimeters across from nine to three o'clock, and it's approximately 35.5 millimeters from 12 to six, measured lug to lug and side to side. It even has little vintage rounded dome style crown, which I absolutely adore. Vacheron sweating the details, and finally putting a Reverso caliber 822 in the back and adjusting it in five positions as a Vacheron should be. So a wonderful team up between JLC and Vacheron on this watch. Remember, LeCoult movements showed up in Vacheron watches as early as the mid 19th century. So this is an old tradition and a great one. So good question from Cam Tibbetts, if I'm pronouncing that correct, uh, correctly. Are square case watches as comfy? I love the Reverso and know the only way to find out for sure if to wear one myself, but as Tim owns so many, curious for his opinion. So if Tim will give his opinion. For me, I think wearing a rectangular watch comes a little bit down to the size, at least for my preference. If it's a rectangular watch that sits within the confines of my wrist, I, I find them to be comfortable. If it's a little bit too large or too thick, um, I think sometimes for me, it can end up being a little bit top heavy, but I think it really comes down to the construction of the watch in general, how thick or thin it is. And then also what you're used to, a lot of it just comes down to your own perception of the watch on your wrist. A lot is gonna come down to how stiff the strap is. Oftentimes you'll have a very stiff strap on a watch. Like yeah. this is This a, loosened up would fit a lot better. Yeah, this is a brand new Vacheron factory strap because that's how we sell our watches. But if you wanted to put it on one of those buttery Hermes Berenia straps like Brian's wearing tonight, you would find that this would wear perfectly and a Reverso would wear perfectly. It's all about getting a very flexible strap because oftentimes the rectangular and the square watches are plank-like across the wrist. They don't have much camber or loft to them, so the way the shape sits is going to be highly dependent on how the strap effectively extends the shape. I would also mention this, guys. We are starting a Patek Philippe promotion at the company. Go on our website right now and all of our non-Nautilus Patek Philippe watches are going to be under some sort of a promotion. From this Wednesday through next Wednesday, we are offering special prices on our Patek Philippe collection right up to and including grand complications. So open a different window, keep us streaming, and check out our Patek Philippe promotion. Special prices, but only for one week. Quick comment from James, I can't even pronounce your name, Junior. Tim, get rid of the weird looking ginger. You are the talent brother. Do, I mean, do I, does it look like I have red hair? No, guys, in, in the control room, fix that, like now. I mean, do they, I mean, does it, I mean, do you think on the screen? I don't think so. I mean, it looks like a, it's like a chestnut brown I from mean, the way that we, I'm looking at it. We got like one dominant color on the screen, it's blue everything. Yeah. We're pandering I mean, to that, modern that's a, that's a, that's a, we call that a, a chestnut <laughs> in the stra in strap lingo. He has very few freckles, I'll have you know. <laughs> okay. Um, let's talk about another watch here on the table. 
um, that I would say is not, you know, I wouldn't call it the big brother to my watch, but in terms of appearance and the way that I'm wearing it, it is quite similar. Why don't we pick up this 5524? Brick Lane, I'm gonna come back to your question right after this. We're talking about a 5524 right here, the white gold Calatrava Pilot Travel Time. Now this watch came out in 2015, and a lot of folks immediately said Longines, Zenith, IWC, but they're missing the point. The details of this watch are what make it a Patek Philippe. True, it's more of a what-if watch. What if Patek Philippe had built vintage pilot's watches in the mid-century? It has very little to tie it to actual Patek history, but the finish, the quality of the details, and the level of execution are what make this a Patek Philippe pilot's watch. The timepiece is a 42, making it one of the largest Calatravas you can buy, and it's also one of the most water resistant, at 60 meters water resistant, not on this strap, mind you, but on a swimmable strap. This is a swimmable watch. The dial of the watch, can we get super close, Andrew? Let's just nail the texture. It is a matte, blasted-like granular finish. It has the surfacing of sandpaper. When I mentioned the details, I mean things like that. Note the hollow, skeletonized counterweight, which is dial color, for the sweep seconds. You see that skeletonized counterweight that is dial color? It disappears, but it's a lovely detail, just like the white gold applique vintage font Arabic numerals. The timepiece also has quarter turn crowns. For activating the travel time function, you have a one quarter lock and unlock feature. And when unlocked, you have the ability, if you wish, to step everything in sequence. And should you not desire that second time zone, you can simply cover it up and clean up the dial. Now I'm gonna lock my crowns. Remember when I talked about moving everything in sequence? You will note that when I set this watch, it has both local and travel time AM PM indicators. So I have night day for both local and travel time. That is very rare in travel time watches. This is effectively the Aquanaut travel time in a more historically evocative package. And I love the pointer style date down at six o'clock. A lot of folks look at this watch and they immediately think it has a small seconds. Clearly it doesn't. One of the most imposing loom shots of any Patek. And it's got the caliber 324 SCFUS handsomely executed and Patek backs it up. Minus three plus two seconds per day or you can make a warranty claim. Now what sets this one apart? It's a custom Jean Rousseau strap from Paris. This is a very custom strap as they even duplicated the cross stitching pattern of the aviator's calfskin that comes with the watch. And they doubled up the alligator giving it an FP Journ style small scale alligator leather on the underside. So this has every indication of being a three, four, even five year strap. It keeps the white gold counterbalanced clevis style pin buckle from the standard watch and as you can see this is a watch that is fully realized i like the aftermarket strap it is perfectly suited to the watch and real money maybe even five six seven hundred dollars spent on that custom strap so you know i know that i say i always like the watches that are on the table and that's because i picked them but this is actually one that you brought and i've always been a huge fan of the pilot watch Number one, I think it's one of the most ingenious complications of any watch that's in the industry in terms of the 12-hour GMT and the way that the, the hands are set. Number two, it's one of the few watches that it, when it was launched, I'll never forget that so much of the press and there were a lot of, you know, a lot of folks that were hating on the watch when it first came out. And it was one of those times where it really, you know, where it felt like they needed to hate on something just because, again, Paddock was, call it, the, the big elephant in the room, no different than if Apple would come out with an iPhone and pundits would say, oh, it could have had this or could have done this. But when asked, oh, are you still gonna buy it? The, you know, the answer always is, oh, of course I would buy it if I was offered the watch. And, you know, you knew right away that they had something special just based on the overall reaction from, call it the, the customers that were collecting the pieces. And it's ahead of its day in terms of everything that's going on about, let's call it the crazy Aquanaut Nautilus market, is that this was the one of the first watches outside of your 5131, which is the you know enamel world time, that 
a watch in the secondary market was bringing over lists. This watch was bringing over the retail price before Aquanauts and before Nautiluses were bringing over the retail price. I will say this, I like everything about this watch except for one detail. I wish there were a little bit more nuance to the case. A sharp break between the lugs and the case band would have been artful and welcome. I do think that is the only smudge on this watch's reputation, other than my fingerprints, of course. But this is a timepiece that delivered on almost every count, and four years later, I still think it's an absolute rush to wear it. It's even slim, only 10.9 millimeters thick. This is a watch with which I can find very little fault. Okay. Okay, Brick Lane, I'm going back to your comment. Can I give you any clarity on when the Hulk will be discontinued. I can say this with almost absolute certainty, and there's very little that's certain with Rolex. The Hulk will be discontinued when this generation of Submariner is retired. Just as with the last generation, the five digit, the Kermit was retired, and then a few years later we got a new green Submariner. It changed. We went from having a green bezel to having a full green dial and bezel. I think the next generation green sub, we're gonna have one, it will be launched shortly after, but not with the next generation Submariner. So I think we see a new sub either next year or the year after. It's gonna be the Daytona or the sub to get the next redesign. The time has come. Mm -hmm. uh, but we're, they're gonna wait. They're gonna give us the basic watch. They're, they might even launch it in precious metal because they know they can sell it. And then wait one year to give us steel. If you remember, the steel Submariner launched with the Hulk. So you had the regular black bezel, black dial, and the Hulk. They came out the same year. Now, finally, I'm also going to say that the next generation is not going to be the Hulk. I expect to see something very different, and it could be one of two things. One, a no-date green sub, which would be different from the first two green subs. Mm -hmm. Or two, we see a version of the green sub that combines the first two, whereas you might have had in the past black and green could be or an updated green Kermit. and green. It could be very much a super case Kermit mm -hmm. with a green bezel and a black dial or it could be a black bezel and a green dial. They could mix and match, but I do not expect them to duplicate either of the last two watches. So within 24 months, we should have our answer. Ceramic Kermit would be very cool. You mean full case? Like a full case, like a, yeah, like a green ceramic bezel with a black dial. Oh, okay. Okay, I thought you meant full case. Yeah. No, that's a Tudor. That's, although I would not be shocked if Tudor eventually does a green black bay. In fact, I'm going to predict that happens. There will be a green bezel general production black bay. It will not just be a Harrods special edition. Something with a green dial or green bezel will find its way to general production. And right here, a longer question from JBO Surf in Adelaide, Australia. 1815 annual calendar or Saxonia annual calendar? I like the 1815's Arabic numerals, so I would probably go with that, just on that basis alone. Sometimes you just like the way a watch looks, and that sways your heart. Okay, now, let's talk about a watch that hasn't gotten a whole lot of attention, because, frankly, steel sports watches have stolen the show. We're sticking with Rolex, and we're talking about the Date 840. Okay. Ryan, what strikes you here? So, here we have a solid 18 karat rose gold Day Date 40 with the white Roman dial. So what strikes me right off the bat, we've had day dates on the on the show before. I am a, number one, I'm a huge uh, believer in, call it the comeback of the all gold, you know, watch for men, especially in this size. I think that slimming down the watch, making the bezel more proportionate to the case was everything that consumers wanted Rolex to do when they switched out of the day date two and transitioned into this watch new movement, longer power reserve. I just, I think that, you know, the watch is just about as perfect as it could ever be. I'll say this, this is as dressy as Rolex can successfully make a watch. Now Rolex can make a dressier watch, but unsuccessfully. The Cellinis have never struck a chord because when people think Rolex dress watch, they still want the capabilities of a Submariner or at the very least a Yachtmaster. This has a 100 meter water resistant case, which means it's an all the time watch. There are a lot of folks who say that you want a watch that can go from the boardwalk to the boardroom, but what you really need is a watch that can go from the bathing suit to the business suit and back. And this gives you that. The watch features a pivoted president bracelet. That's a critical change from the Day Day 2. It's not just the better proportioning, it's the fact that the watch wears much more compact on the wrist 
thanks to those pivoted end links that allow the watch to span only 47 millimeters across the wrist instead of a monstrous 53 like the Date 8 II. So the timepiece is more wearable by more people. When you throw it on the wrist, you realize the proportion is great. It'll fit underneath any cuff. The only thing it's lacking, and that's by choice, is loom. But whereas there are loomed versions of the Date 840, I happen to like this dial. It's the dramatic combination. I wish it had loom plots, though. I'm not sure. You wouldn't have quite the sharpness of those faceted rose gold Arabic Even, even at the top? Roman even if they numerals. have plots at the top on, on, the, on the tachometer thing? I think what they would have to do is they would have to put the plots on the inside of the bezel. The Roman numerals here are so beautifully cut. They're almost faceted like the fluted bezel. They have a cut gem-like twinkle. So if I were to do loom here, I would do something maybe like they did on the original Yacht Master, where there were loom plots next to that's what I was thinking. Indices. Yeah. Or or do what JLC did with the Geophysic Tribute and put the loom on the inside of the bezel. That would look cool too. That would definitely look cool. And you know, overall what I think is I mean, my favorite iteration of this particular watch is this with the green dial. Fed was just a uh, rocking one after Wimbledon. And yeah. the watch is absolutely awesome. And you can see that it's the sort of watch when he was wearing it that it's something that you could wear, call it more casually or for dress when looking at him wearing the watch, you wouldn't have said it was overly blingy or anything like that. And I think that that's one of the hallmarks of Rolex is that they can produce a watch like this where I, I really don't think it's that overly blingy. I think it's like almost like understated luxury at that level. I would also say this, the rose gold is in good taste. It's warm, it's handsome, it works well with any skin tone. How much do you love the double quick set system here? It's just fun to play with. I'll also mention one of the key changes with the Date 840 was the arrival of the three-day power reserve movement. So it's now a three-day power reserve. So if there's a day when you want to wear something that is much sportier or a beater watch, you don't necessarily have to reset the watch every time you pick it up. And it's also important to note that the signature of this generation of the Date 8 was the laser cut dial. And this is different from all of those, whereas almost all of the Date 840s you see have the laser etched dial. This feels more special because it's so different. The chalk white, and it is a matte white, not a gloss, and the stylized rose gold Roman numerals really make this dial pop. Yeah. So. Huge fan of the watch. Um, By the way, that's Roger Federer, for those of you who are asking. Oh, did they not know what Fed meant? No. Well, every, right here. I mean, it's like the greatest guy on the planet. So I'm not I'm not really a tennis fan. You, I mean, look at the tan lines, guys. I'm following the Tour they de France right now. They call that a tennis tan. Farmer's tan, but like it's also like a tennis tan from the... I call yeah. it a lycra tan. Yeah. Okay, let's go back into the box right here. Okay. We have all sorts of comments and questions. I have a uh, question from Cam Tibbetts. Are the numerals handmade? On that Rolex, no. No, yeah, actually, I, and I believe So people are commenting. I, I like how Brian called him fed like they go way back. Number one, if you're into tennis, he is fed all over the world. Number two, I have actually met Roger Federer, and he's one of the nicest people on the planet. And I met him at the Rolex booth several bottles back. So. I don't know any really cool pro athletes. No, wait, I do know one. Back in the day, I got Johnny O'Connell, who was a Corvette racer, to take a picture with me at Petit Le Mans. And for years and years, I, I had that on the fridge. People who didn't know me would come over. They'd be like, is that your dad? I'd be like, yeah, that's my dad. <laughs> so let's talk about a timepiece that is very much in keeping with the spirit of handcraft. We had a question about the handmade numerals on the Rolex. On the Rolex, those are not handmade, but the features of this dial are handmade, and they are hand-placed. This is the Grand Seiko SBGH045 Titanium 44 GS case, and let me denude it of my finger oils. I feel really bad. doesn't do justice to the Zeratsu finish. But this is a watch that is effectively your Rolex date just 41 alternative now titanium 40 millimeters it has the 44 gs case which is remarkably polygonal they actually call it a polyhedron sharply faceted it harks back to the original grand seiko 44 gs of 1967 Everything on this case is black polished where it's not satin, and that is all hand finished on a tin wheel. 
The features of the dial, including the Dauphine-style hands, which are both polished and satinated, as well as the faceted indices on the dial, they are hand-finished, and you can see that lush, red-brown metallic finish, which is both metallic and lacquered to achieve that finish. It's an exceptional watch with a high beat movement, 36,000 vibrations per hour, 10 beats per second, all of it powered by a 55-hour 9S automatic. It is a very special watch. And light on the wrist. So we we just had a question. Did you talk about the dial color or not yet? I, I did. I just I mentioned it. But okay, because I, I think we just had a question from the chat. What color is that dial? It looks ox blood red. It's actually a very 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 dark brown. So it's hard to even see in in the light because it it appears almost black there. You can see at that angle. You can best see the color. It does have a little bit of an ox blood undertone to it. It's principally brown, but with a little bit of a reddish tone to it. It's certainly designed to be complex and defy easy categorization. Grand Seiko watches are that way. They tend to do things differently, and they want you to look closer and closer still at their dials, which I believe are the best in the industry, including Rolex. Now, I, I cleaned more of my finger oils off that case so you can better see the black polish. Normally, when you see black polish on a Swiss watch, it's on a small component inside the movement. With Grand Seiko, you get a component the size of a watch, the size of a case, and it is black polished. So that's a hand-finished watch at a very accessible price. Okay. So I think that is all that we have for today. I mean, we talked about most of the watches on the table. You know, the rest we can actually leave for the next show. And we had a question, how much? $4,400 for that watch. We don't want the whole show to be about prices, but we do have them available if you ask. It's All not right. gonna be like, buy, 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 going, 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 call now, get a free foot massager. That's for Watches Live, that's your show. Yeah, <laughs> you know, we give the stuff, the foot massager is always for Watches Live, duh. Okay, well, we appreciate everybody logging onto the show as always. If you have any questions or any watches that you want to see brought onto the show, feel free, email myself or Tim. Anything that's available that we can, you know, that's accessible to us to grab, we're happy to bring it on and talk about it. And if there's any questions or topics that you want talked about on the show, again, if you email us in advance, we're happy to do it. And remember, our Patek Philippe promotion this Wednesday through next Wednesday. Going, going, gone, everything must go. That's not steel. <laughs> again, my name is Brian. I'm Tim. This is the Watch Insider, and thank you all for logging on.